Good morning, everyone. So today we're going to talk about concussion, and uh, there's a lot of things that we need to talk about, uh, and we probably won't get through them all. So I'm going to ask to leave the questions to the end, because otherwise there's absolutely no way we're going to get through things. Um, and so I'll try to give you as much information that I know and understand that, that, that you can tolerate. There's going to be too much stuff on the slides, so don't worry too much about that. It's more for my reference because I'm paranoid about forgetting something than anything else. So this talk is called Concussion and Primary Care, and, and what I mean is anyone who sees anyone with concussion in an emergency department, in a GP practice, uh, at the sports field, uh, in an urgent care clinic, and it really does cross over all areas. Uh, a lot of the stuff I do is, is technically more sort of short to long term follow up, and we'll talk about why that is, um, and I'm entirely self trained as far as that goes. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest, uh, and I'm supposed to have put the slide in, so that's good. So this is a slide uh, showing some of the people from the fourth international conference on sport, and we've actually just had the fifth in Berlin uh, late last year. And unfortunately, I've been extremely patiently waiting for the consensus statement to be released and its findings, but it is still not available. And will there be any shocking discoveries? There's been changes every single time, and these conferences have been every three to four years. Um, What's different about sports concussion to regular concussion? The only difference is sports. And the problem with sports players is they want to get back into sport. So, so we've learned a lot about concussion science from the sports doctors and the sports people. So, so it is an important learning tool, but you've got to remember that there's no difference. The brain injury is still a brain injury. Um, and this is the supposed time frame, and it's kind of a bit vague as to when we're going to actually get these findings. Will it make some changes? Yes, it will. Do we know what those changes are? No, no one will tell me, so that's a bit unfortunate. Um, so, definitions. Now, I don't know about you, but I find concussion extremely confusing, and this is the theoretical concussion definition. And as you can see, there are a lot of words that mean not a lot. So, concussion is a traumatic brain injury where a force passes through the brain. So that force can come from anywhere. So you can have a force transmitted through your foot, through your body, to your head, to your brain to produce concussion. Supposedly there's rapid onset of reversible neurological function. The most important thing I think is that the, the, the injury is, is structurally normal. So the definition of concussion is there is no structural change. If it's structural, it's something else. So I kind of think of three, three different things. You've got head injury, which is an injury to the head. You've got mild traumatic brain injury, which is concussion. And then you've got structural brain injuries. The problem is, how do you tell the difference? The truth is it's entirely retrospective. So my experience has told me that there is no way to conclusively exclude concussion in a head injury, and there's no way to conclusively say how long it's going to take to recover. Concussion can be obvious, and you saw that wonderful slide there with a referee, which I felt deeply uh, was knocked out. But there's a lot of myths and there's a lot of misconceptions. But if you think you can exclude a concussion, you're better than 99% of the people in the world currently who treat concussion. Um, so the, the definition as this cat is finding with this hedgehog is very confusing and we don't necessarily speak the same language. The best definition I've seen as to what, what concussion, and by concussion I mean mild traumatic brain injury, we'll get into that in a second, it's a metabolic disorder in the brain cells. That's what it is and therefore we don't have any imaging technology that's capable of detecting this. So all we do is see what, what happens and, and, and reflect on that. Um, oops. Right, so traumatic brain injury. So you, 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 you hear this word mild traumatic brain injury and it's extremely confusing. So you have mild traumatic brain injury, moderate traumatic brain injury, severe traumatic brain injury. The decision is made pretty much immediately. 
Is mild mild? There's no way that you can confirm that. So the difference is your, your coma score when you're first seen, the length of time of unconsciousness, um, and your post-traumatic amnesia. So those three things determine when you have a mild traumatic brain injury, a moderate traumatic brain injury, or a severe traumatic brain injury. Severe traumatic brain injury tends to do worse than mild traumatic brain injury. Concussion is mild traumatic brain injury. Does this definition make any sense whatsoever? Absolutely not. But that's the definition we live with. So, so your, your, your Glasgow coma sore, your length of amnesia, and your loss of consciousness. Those are the three things that define this. But this has really got nothing to do with the actual work of dealing with concussion. Obviously, the severity of the traumatic brain injury is important because all moderate to severe tra traumatic brain injuries should have scans. But that's obvious because they look like shit and they feel like shit. So, um, but we'll go more into that. But that's what we're talking about when we talk about traumatic brain injury. But concussion equals mild traumatic brain injury. Um, but as you can see, the definitions are confusing. Um, is it mild? Not necessarily. Is it usually mild? Yes. Is it retrospective? Yes. You never really know if someone's better. And as I said, there's a difference between head injury and brain injury, which is not obvious at the time. So this is a rather large slide, but in actual fact, it, it's... it's it's quite good, and it's, it's what we currently know in sports. So um, 80 to 90 percent of concussions resolve within 7 to 10 days, 99 percent by 21 days. So that's an important fact. Most people do very well. Can you tell who's going to do very well when you first see the patient? Usually not. It's very challenging. Um, but the odds are in their favor. So it's, it's a bell-shaped curve. So you, you really don't see the people. Can you tell? when someone has recovered, and we'll talk about that again, no. So we have rules in sports because they have to be better before they go back to contact sports. And there is so much we don't know about concussion. There is a huge amount that we don't know. And so that's why we have these sports rules. And unless you only do concussion work and you have access to complex neuropsychological assessments for more than an hour, you should never, ever, 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 ever clear a concussed person in less than 21 days. If you take for, for contact sports. I mean, that's got nothing to do with everybody else, but if you clear someone in less that, in that time, then there is no science to back that up whatsoever. Um, and I know lots of people do, and professional sports doctors will do that, but that's fine. We'll leave that to them. Um, uh, so in, in an emergency situation, if someone has a lower GCS, call an ambulance. Simple. Is it hard to tell the difference between a mild traumatic brain injury and a severe brain injury or even a, a structural brain injury, it, it can be very, very challenging, but time is usually important. And that time is usually you know, sort of two to four hours. If you're not in an environment where you can safely observe one f person for that time and you're not sure, then you should get that person to that environment. Um, do, does everyone need a scan? Well, it's almost no. full time. Now, before we go, let's turn back the clock to the first Trans-Tasman League test of 1991. Yes, it was back in the days of Gary Freeman and Frano Bodica, and when Tawara Nico and Richie Blackmore would actually play together in the same team. And, of course, who can ever forget Dean Lonigan's KO in the opening seconds of that game? New Zealand winners by 24 to 8. Abdobo, good night. Now, this is the incident of Lonigan putting his head in the wrong position. He put his head right in front of Roach and he took a shoulder and a forearm and he ended up in Disneyland. Oh mate, yeah, it was a bit sore at the time. It, it wasn't overly bad. Like the doc came straight on and was uh, asking questions and I was fairly, I was coherent, you know, so it wasn't really a problem. If this man could get wound up... So, uh, one of the most famous clips I think in sporting concussion, concussion in this country. So, first of all, it's obvious that he has concussion. He is also having a small post-concussion convulsion, which is, is not usually important. And then he lies to the media the day afterwards. So uh, now that, that things have progressed, he has given interviews saying he cannot remember anything about that day. So he's saying, oh, yeah, I was talking to the doctor. I was absolutely fine because he's seen some clips on television. Uh, retrospectively, he is not telling the truth at all. So um, traumatic brain injury is the most serious of all injuries and can be responsible for death. Mild traumatic brain injury does not kill you. 
When you die, we call it something else. That's the difference. So it's called a severe traumatic brain injury. It's called diffuse cerebral swelling. It's called bleeding. So, so, so concussion doesn't kill anyone. It's something else that kills them. But can concussion cause death? That's still not understood. So we'll go through that as well. Um, the questions that you're always asking yourself when you're first seeing a patient are, is it concussion? Is it worse? Do they need CT? And, and are they safe? And those are difficult questions to answer in a short period of time. Um, myths. Okay, so 10% of concussions will uh, present with loss of consciousness. 90% of concussion will present with no loss of consciousness. So big, big myth to dispel. And if you don't know that already and you take away one point, that's an important thing to point out. Um, do you wake up normal from a coma? No. So if you had a coma, you're not going to be very good afterwards. But that's not usually concussion. That's going to be moderate to severe brain injury. Uh, a second blow to the head cures concussion. Hopefully no one actually believes that anymore. Uh, it's easy to tell how bad a head injury is. It's very, very, very difficult. And they talk about the concept of delayed concussion. And often with sports, you see people on Monday, and I always work Monday, so I'm always seeing people who've had a head knock, or whatever you want to call it, and they go to school or to work or whatever, and they feel awful. That's the so-called delayed concussion. But because they haven't been using their brain, their brain didn't even know they were concussed. It's very common. People can appear completely normal following a head injury. An acute head injury assessment. So in the news today, they were talking about concussion and, and rugby and uh, one game, Scotland versus England, where there was five concussions. And how many of the people passed a head injury assessment? So an HIA or whatever. Lots of them. So the myth that you can easily assess a head injury and say this is concussion, this isn't concussion, I don't think you can say something's not concussion ever until you've had 72 hours, would be my sort of rule. So if that terrifies anyone, great. Um, we don't usually see stars. You can have abnormal vision, but no one has 20 birds around the head, another myth. There are two broad guidelines. One is how uncommon. So we'll skip that. So that is, is how bad is concussion, and it talks about um, the GCS and things. So the Glasgow Coma Score is important. Um, and so it's, it helps us differentiate between the severity of a traumatic brain injury and to decide whether we're thinking that it's a structural brain injury. And, and everyone should know the GCS. The most important thing, I guess, from the GCS is that 15, a GCS of 15 means you're completely orientated to time, place, and person and should be able to answer five questions correctly. Um, Amnesia, as we saw from one of those earlier slides, amnesia is an important thing. And, and one of the things that I think one of the head injury rules, and I may be going out on a limb here, uh, is wrong is it says retrospe retrospective amnesia of 30 minutes. So retrograde amnesia is determined at the second of the head injury. And so it's an event that the brain has stored. So therefore, it's not important. Anterograde amnesia is very important because that's the function of the brain laying down new memories. And Professor Arthur Shaws from Westmead developed a, a, a very rapid amnesia score where he's got these pictures that you show a patient every hour. And we, div we got that into North Shore Emergency Department so that you could do amnesia testing very quickly. And it takes a minute to, to assess. Patients shouldn't be set home if they're in amnesia. They should be observed. Does it mean they need a CAT scan? Not necessarily. Um, there's lots of signs of concussion. So the brain does everything, and everything can go wrong. So the problem is where there's crossover. And I'm seeing people, as I say, up to a year following head injuries uh, and mild traumatic brain injury. Um, one of the things that I do that may be slightly different is I never say someone has post-concussion syndrome. So in the first year, it is persisting concussion symptoms. Why do I do that? People do not get better from syndromes. People get better from symptoms. And there's lots of research saying that if you say this is persisting concussion symptoms, they are much, much, much more likely to get better. And they do. Almost all of them get better if you, if you present it in that fashion. Uh, and, and I usually am re reviewing their symptoms. And then we look through each symptom, and we'll talk a bit more about that, and say, look, what can we do for that? So um, important things about concussion is when, when you determine that someone has concussion, coded on an ACC form as concussion, S60. Don't call it anything else. And, and this is vitally important because ACC funds only two conditions 
for longer term, and that's post-concussion syndrome and concussion. So call everything concussion. Uh, if it's not, they cannot be seen by a concussion clinic service. And the concussion clinics do a very, very important role. And this is for the people with symptoms more than 21 days, basically, or more than 10 days even, um, that they have neurologists, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, balanced physiotherapists, behavioral optometrists, they don't have doctors. They have neurologists, but they, these people can't do their medication certificates and do their um, medical certificates and stuff like that. So there needs to be a key doctor involved in well. So, so when I say I do a concussion clinic, I follow people till they're better for up to a year, and I help the concussion clinic, and I help the patients, and I explain things to them. And when, when I talk to my patients, there's an analogy that I use, and I say concussion is like driving a manual car stuck in first gear. So the brain can't change gear, and so that's why it feels horrible to have concussion. That's why you forget things. That's why you get confused. That's why you get fatigued. That's why you have fatigue headaches, because your brain can't change gear. And it will slowly change gear, and if you try to force a recovery, it will go badly. So you have to follow the symptoms. Um, one, one thing with concussion, one symptom, one sign equals concussion. If they have loss of consciousness, they have concussion. If they have a persisting headache, they have concussion. If they're persistently dizzy, they have concussion. If they can't sleep the night afterwards, they have concussion. Um, resolution of the symptom does not mean full resolution, especially for contact sports. It's very hard to clear someone and say they're definitely clear. Ah, so this graph is the bell-shaped graph. So some people with concussion will recover in 30 seconds, and some people will take a year. 1% of people take more than 21 days to recover. So you're always thinking that things are going to go well, hopefully. Oh, you okay? I'm fine. Let's go. Hold on. Where are you? I'm in New York. Who am I? <laughs> and who are you? I'm back. Sit down. You don't understand. I'm Batman. I do, I do. Not going anywhere for a while? Grab a Snickers. Hello, good citizen. My name is Batman. You could be my assistant. Would you like that? Would you like to ride with Batman? It's always interesting to see people the day after a head injury when you see them on the first day and to ask them, you know, what do you remember? And that's always the first question. And is it taking a history? Well, it's actually trying to work out how much their brain is dysfunctioning. And often you, they, people have this sort of Swiss cheese brain where they remember soon after the injury and, and then they kind of remember the next day. And so it's good to sort of record how much of a memory lapse they have. Um, the biggest decision you're always wondering is, 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 and I call it structural brain injury, do they have some kind of structural brain injury? And I, I have a broader definition, skull fractures, cerebral swelling, bleeding, etc. Now, these may or may not be neurosurgical events, and a lot of the clinical decision rules are to determine neurosurgical events, but, but I think from our, most of our guys' practice, we want to know if there's anything structural going on, and that's important. And that can sometimes be very, very difficult. So, so usually there's a structural change, which may be just di diffuse cerebral swelling that results in death from head injury. But it's very hard, and we were talking, Salim and I were talking about um, the cricketer Hughes who died uh, uh, playing cricket, and he had a carotid dissection apparently, but it's very, very hard to tell what's going on. Um, if you saw that, you wouldn't know what had caused his collapse, and you would be worried about a brain injury or carotid injury, but does it really matter? No, obviously it was catastrophic. Um, this is a, an extradural, uh, and you can see the lovely midline shift, and this is what we're all worried about, the, the walk and die scenario, and it does exist, um, and so that's why People should be observed if they're showing extreme symptoms. So d does it mean they need a CAT scan? Well, sometimes it does. And as you can see, the levels of severity. Um, the GCS is important, but almost always the people I see have a GCS of 15. Um, if the GCS is less than 15, they should be observed until it's 15 and consider, you know, they, they may need some imaging. And, and that's always on the back of my mind. Um, and we've got this picture again. I've got too many slides, I know. Um, medical assessment is always important. Clinical status is always important. And uh, uh, neuroimaging, 
Neuroimaging doesn't help in concussion. It helps in excluding the other stuff. So, so, so neuroimaging, neuroimaging is not usually important in the people that I'm following up. And I don't care if they've not had a scan, if the story you know, is, is not um, con consistent with a structural brain injury. The one exception that you've got to be really careful with is the old people. So those over 65 with persistent concussion symptoms, you worry whether they've got a subdural because the slow leak can be very, very hard to distinguish. And the first autopsy I ever attended was a subdural hematoma in a 78-year-old where they'd had a fall. And, and that's a tough one. And it's usually the older people. So that's why... Um, wow. Unfortunately, that's when we ran into a brick wall. I'm head of the radiology department. You call me in from home to do an abdominal CAT scan that could wait until Monday morning. Well, guess what? It's not happening. Dr. Moyer. These are my machines! Sir. My machine! So anyone who's worked in ED has had that experience with the radiology department. And and to be honest, it's it's not something you know, we don't lightly scan people's brains and probably we scan them too much. And it's always a serious decision. And and when I when because I work in the community now, I'm not necessarily sending someone to hospital to have a scan. I'm sending them into hospital to be observed to make a decision whether they need a scan and especially in children there's a more of an emphasis on on observe um, but they've got to be observed in a safe environment in a in a medical environment um, and when you when you see children with head injuries for instance if we were to talk all about that you often have the sort of minimal head injury so not really not even reaching the mild traumatic brain injury no real signs of concussion but they've obviously had a head injury and those are the ones that when I hear the story you know they hit the head um, they cried immediately, they were okay, and they're running around in the room. I say, you know, go home, but then you go into the advice if there's vomiting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's always challenging when it's really late at night because you're sort of thinking, oh gosh, they're going to go to sleep. If they've got definite concussion symptoms, you need a bit of time. So sometimes I'm sending people to be observed and sometimes I observe them myself. But you've got to think, it, 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 the place where you're working, is it safe to observe this child? Um, and we'll talk about head injury rules in a second. Um, uh, we'll, I think we've got the actual, uh, so for the children head injury rules, there's the chalice and there's the pecan. And um, Stuart Dalziel, who was talking later, was, was uh, talking more about pecan. Um, and I think that some of the things that he said was good, that the pecan allows you to determine who doesn't need a scan. And I think that's, that's really good. And this is one of the head injury rules. So, when children have a head injury, again, you're deciding, is it a structural injury? Do they need observation? Do they need a scan? And more often than not, they need to be observed. And even isolated vomiting is not a, a true indicator for always doing a scan in children, although it is a very important sign. And children, um, if it's the only symptom that they have, they, they, they often it's just concussive. But I think that they do need to be observed if they're vomiting repeatedly and often they're observed for four hours post the last vomit and things like that. But if, if they've got a prolonged loss of consciousness, if they've got signs of a skull fracture, uh, if they've had any fitting, th then neuroimaging is almost certainly going to occur. And th that is an important part of the head injury workup, but it's not part of the management of concussion per se, but it's very, very, very important. It's what we worry about most. Um, so this is the younger than two years of age pecan rule. Um, and and it, it's also about observation. So, so as you see there, you've got head injury, CT recommended, and you've got observation versus CT. And I think that's an important distinction in the pecan rule that I like more and more. Originally, I liked to see the chalice rule because it was nice and black and white. But I think there are huge shades of grey. So... Um, the, the hematoma thing is quite important, and there's been so so more than five centimeters of hematoma or a laceration that's usually non-frontal, so as it says there, occipital, parietal, or temporal scalp hematoma. So for those, it's usually under one. So the the, the but there is some interesting evidence about about that. So so a large hematoma is a reason to have a child observed at least, um, and that's the older children pecan rule. So the, um, the CT head rule, um, the Canadian CT head rule is the adult one. Um, so lowered, oh, sorry, that's a children's chalice one. We'll just go back to here. 
Okay, so this is the Canadian CT head rule. GCS less than 15 at two hours post-injury. So that's confusion. Uh, suspected skull fracture, so CSF flick, raccoon eyes, battle sign. Uh, or a wound that's, you know, I remember seeing a patient at North Shore in uh, an observation room for suturing that when I unbandaged the head there was brain matter all over the place and they'd been hit by a brick at the Kumu Wine and Food Festival. So there's two lessons there. Uh, one is don't go to the Kumu Wine and Food Festival. Um, vomiting greater than or equal to two episodes. So this is an important sign that occurs in concussion and structural brain injury and the number of times I've scanned someone based on that and that they've got a small epidural bleed is significant. Age greater than 65, so you may say, gosh that's controversial, but the subdural hematoma is a real entity. Um, so, so if you're not going to scan someone over the age of 65 with concussion, you should observe them review them the next day or arrange for them to be reviewed the next day and just a few weeks ago I read through the notes from a 68 year old who'd had a fall, didn't speak English and it was a discharge summary from Middlemore Hospital with their subdural and it wasn't my patient, it wasn't even my clinic's patient but I was thinking gosh they should have picked up the Canadian CT head rule and, and made arrangements so I, I, that's the one thing that I'm really hard on that the radiation risk doesn't occur in that group and there's a significant number of them that will get subdurals. Um, so when you've got persistent symptoms and, and I think even a week down the track I send people in for a scan and you, and you know if they're deteriorating even longer than that that they need a scan as part of the workup. And then I'm quite happy if they've had a scan apart from if they're on anticoagulates and you've got to remember that this this excludes people on anticoagulants. All people with anticoagulants with concussion should be observed at least and probably scanned. Some controversies there. In, in life, there are more in concussion, there's more controversies than there are facts, unfortunately. Um, does anyone know who this is? No football fans. Petracek. So Petracek is now the Arsenal keeper and a few years ago he got a knee to the head and had a, a, a depressed skull fracture. So he has to wear a Canterbury helmet because if he gets wounds on his scalp it could infect the plate in his skull and so it's and also um, uh, headgear does not prevent concussion in any way shape or form so it's not to prevent that it's to prevent his his brain being done. So the symptoms of concussion, there's, there's a lot of symptoms. So they can be physical, emotional, cognitive, sleep related. And I always do an assessment and I use the sideline concussion assessment tool number three. So the SCAT and uh, it's a sports concussion assessment tool but it's really good because it has this post concussion symptom score and you can just ask them about these symptoms and see how bad they are. And then and then you look at, you know, what can we do about these symptoms. The initial management of concussion is rest. What's interesting is there's some controversies about what that means, but also prevention of secondary injury. They must not play contact sports. They must take it easy. Um, there are lots of things you can do to assess a concussed patient. Um, using a form I think is really good and the sports ones are really really good because they have absolutely in there everything in there and I've got one up which will show but there's lots of other ones like the acute ass concussion assessment, the ACE form and things like that. Just choose one. Um, interesting thing down the bottom here, genetic testing. Um, huge ethical dilemma but the ApoE4 genotype is the concussion gene which predisposes people to severe concussions. Now you imagine you've got a professional sports person or a youth and they've got this gene and you know they've got this gene should they play contact sport. Um, so that's an ethical dilemma and, and I'm glad we don't routinely test for that. Uh, so subtle concussion as I talked before 90% of concussions have no loss of consciousness and so Often it's not going to present straight away and, and I think I've got an example of that in a second. Uh, oh, okay, well, it'll come up soon. So if you're seeing someone on the sports field or whatever, you ask them a simple question. Um, so they're often just called, called the Maddox questions. What field are we at? What team are we playing today? Uh, who, who are you playing against? Which half are we in? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I t tend to stick to five questions. Who scored last? Which half are we in? And if those questions fail, they've got concussion because they're confused. And then I do a 30 second balance test, which is again on the concussion assessment tool. So standing with your eyes shut for 30 seconds, 
they fall over, they've got concussion, and we'll go through that in more depth. Uh, yeah, so here we go, the Sideline Concussion Assessment Tool 3. It's free. Uh, you can get it, download it from anywhere, every sports thingy uses it. Now all the other assessment tools for concussion are exactly the same, just written in different orders. So it's got your GCS, it's got your sideline assessment, it's got your MADIC questions. Um, on the next page, so this is the, the most important bit here. Oh, missed. Those, so here it's called the PCSS or Post Concussion Symptom Score. And this tells you how the person feels and it rates it from zero to six. Now all concussion assessment tools use exactly the same thing in different orders and it's wonderful. Um, and sometimes I just do that because I'm not really interested in everything else. And then there's also a cognitive assessment down here which is uh, called a SAC or a cognitive assessment and it's out of 30 points and less than 26 is abnormal. Now there's a problem with that because you have to have done it before the head injury as well. So it's a, it's a rather retrospective type thing and it's quite cool and it does show you how, how, mm, how much their brain is effective but does it tell you how long it's going to last? No. Does it tell you really how severe it is? No. Does it tell you they're better? If you've done it repeatedly it can. Um, and um, I, I usually just do the post-concussion symptom score because I'm not really interested in, in the other stuff that much unless I have to clear someone um, at the 21 days. So if there's a deadline, I, I like to do repeated um, cognitive assessments. But to be honest, I just don't have time to do all that sort of stuff. Um, concussion clinics don't use this. They use a much more in-depth one, and these is usually an hour long. Um, if you get good at this, you can usually do it in 10 minutes. And most of it can be done by a nurse, but I don't seem to find any nurses really interested in doing it, but that's okay. Um, so there you've got these symptoms and it's interesting because when I do this I go through it and say all right so you've got physical symptoms, you've got brain fog and fatigue symptoms, you've got emotional symptoms and then I tailor what I'm going to do about that. So, so some people have severe balance disruption, some people have severe photophobia and phonophobia and it also matters where they are post concussion because after about 21 days, they need to start doing things no matter how bad that is. So, some, so in the acute concussion, it's fine to wear sunglasses because the light's hurting your eyes, but later on, it's very important that they get used to light. So you may use things like sunglasses or photochromic lenses outside, but they must not wear sunglasses inside. You can change the computer. Um, light contrast, de decrease the amount of blue light, that's fine. You can wear noise reduction headphones, but you need to start to become accustomed to these stimuli, otherwise you will never recover from them. So, but that's later down the track. So at 20 days, you're thinking, right, we need to start exposure to these things again. But acute concussion is basically avoidance for that sort of first seven days. Um, and, and this is a really good uh, highlight that sort of puts them into clusters and I like to look at that and sort of think what am I going to do next and, um, and obviously you guys will all receive these slides. But, um, and, that, and it's got instructions. So you read this and it tells you exactly how to do the SAC um, and it tests your immediate mentory, it tests your concentration and, it's, it's, and your delayed recall. So it's really quite cool. Um, and of course what's going to happen when the fifth consensus and concussion is released? They're going to produce a new SCAT. And so I was hoping it was going to be released but of course it isn't. And there is a child version. Um, for, so this version is from 12 up and there's one from 5 to 12. And those of you who've read the new paediatric pathways for the management of acute head injury, I don't know if you're confused as I am, but I really can't understand it and I deal with head injuries all the time. There seems to be three to four steps for every child, so I try to simplify things a little bit because I'm a very simple person. Um, and that's the, the digits concentration. Uh, and once you get good at doing this, it's quite fun to be honest. Um, so how do you interpret this? Hmm. If they have symptoms, they have concussion. If they don't have symptoms and it's more than 21 days, they're cleared to play sports and, and their, their testing is normal. But you cannot interpret one um, assessment. That's the problem, unless they've had pre-play testing. So all professional sports people have uh, computerised versions of this that are tested before and after head injuries, and then you can say things are normalising. But 
There's no way you can say someone's not concussed. That's one of the problems. And, and every nasty concussion in, in sport, you realise that they, they pass their head injury assessments on the field and they're back on the field, and it's like, obviously they're not. So it does worry me a lot, and the, the stuff.co.nz has the Prime Minister talking about concussion. Um, so there are more controversies in concussion than there, is, there, there are facts. So that's a really good example of subtle concussion. That he is t talking complete and utter gibberish, but he's standing up, he's walking, he's talking, he looks apparently normal. So, so then you talk to them and it's blah, 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 blah. Um, it's always very interesting when people are in the middle of that dramatic amnesia. So in, in, in the sideline or in the emergency department, you see people in there, they are completely gaga and, you know, why am I here, what happened? A minute later, why am I here, what happened? Um, and it's, it, it is all, it's both serious and extremely funny at the same time, which is unfortunate. You have to try to keep a straight face. But the reality is they, they're not laying down any new memory. And it's important to see those people until they start laying down new memory. And I don't think anyone should ever be sent home or discharged in an amnestic state. Because you don't know, if they're in amnesia, you don't know whether it's mild traumatic brain injury or moderate traumatic brain injury. And in 24 hours of amnesia, it's moderate traumatic brain injury. And that is significantly worse prognosis. The problem is that some people with severe traumatic brain injury recover very fast. And some people with mild traumatic brain injury never recover. So how mild is mild traumatic brain injury? That is a question that, that is um, not answered. Um, so. This is, this is a little bit more about initial uh, concussion, and I apologise for the fact that my talk is absolutely all over the place. Uh, the problem is there's so many thoughts that run around in my brain. So, patients who are still having quite significant concussion symptoms should be observed for four hours post-injury. They must be discharged to a safe environment, so they must not go home alone, or to drunk people. Uh, they must not drive a motor vehicle for 24 hours. They should not fly on an aeroplane for 12 to 24 hours. Uh, the only treatment that's known initially is rest. Most importantly, cognitive rest, physical rest, and they should be re-evaluated. Now, physical rest we're going to talk more about because there's some interesting studies coming about, about that. Most importantly, to prevent secondary brain injury. So there is a condition known as second impact syndrome that is very strongly supported in the US and not supported in the rest of the world. If you have not recovered from another brain injury and you get an another one, your brain swells up and you die. So that's a summary of second impact syndrome. Um, we don't really know whether it exists. And uh, Paul McCory, who is the world's biggest expert on sport concussion, believes that anyone can get diffuse cerebral swelling and die. But that is not concussion. And, and we, do, we know that another injury before recovery is always worse. So you see that over and over again. Concussions are cumulative. Um, Following up concussions, it's very important to review them the next week and, and usually at week three and before any sports, and they should always get clearance. Now, some of you will work in... How many of you work in general practice? Great. Okay, so, so what I do is much more general practice-like, but I don't do any other general practice. I only do concussion as, as I follow them up till they are absolutely better or one year has passed. And so I do an hour on a Monday and two hours on a Tuesday and I see about 13 concussed patients each week. Uh, and then everything else I do is just urgent care. So, so this is extremely relevant to you, you guys and I think you, you are the mainstay of the concussion workers. So um, always code concussion as S60. Always review them early. Do not allow them to go back to sport and then make referrals at day 10 to a concussion clinic that you're comfortable with if they're not better, because all the funding goes to the concussion clinic. You can send the referral, and I'll show you the form in a sec, to ACC or a concussion clinic. Those of you who work in Auckland, I really like Proactive, and I've got some details on that, um, because they're very good with mild traumatic brain injury. And so I send all my referrals directly to them because I know how they manage and I know their neurologists and stuff like that. But they must have an understanding doctor and you must have written information for your patients. I have literally about a hundred documents that I routinely choose what I want. So I've got a document called Fatigue and Concussion, What to Expect. I've got a document called 
um, head, headaches. So headaches and concussion are multifactorial. So they can be migraine-like, they can be tension-like, they can be cervicogenic, they can be rebound pain relief headaches, and they can be all four mixed in together. So you've got that science saying that these headaches are this type, but basically all headaches need to be managed with a multidisciplinary group. Um, and we'll talk about some treatments in a sec. Um, Happy Hunger Games, and may the odds be ever in your favour. So it's an odds thing with concussion. 99% of the people do very well very quickly, and 1% need really intensive follow-up, and they need a caring doctor who's going to follow the stuff up and look at their symptoms and look at what can be done. This is an exercise program, and it's one of the more internationally returned to exercise programs, and it talks about stepwise recovery uh, with relation to the symptoms. Um, I will talk more about that later. But So there's an interesting study, which you're going to see in a minute, that said um, children aged 5 to 18 who went straight back into exercise, excluding contact sports, did better. So I'm finding that very, very interesting, and a lot of people in the industry, so to speak, are very interested in this. There is a lot of evidence that says exercise early, so probably after 72 hours, improves outcome. So there are three things in concussion. There is cognitive rest, so resting the brain, turning off electronic devices, not trying to study, etc., not going to work, is very important. And cognitively, you follow the symptoms and allow them to do more only as their brain allows. There's secondary injury prevention. They must not play contact sports. And there's exercise. Exercise carefully is good for brain recovery. And you can use, you can use one of these pathways because you know or you can say, well, let's start with a little bit of exercise and see how you feel afterwards. Obviously, if you've never exercised before in your life, it's not a good time to start. So it depends whether you're a very active person. And very active people feel horrible if they can't exercise. And there is some good evidence suggesting exercise is good for concussion recovery. So that's completely against everything else that we've learned for the last 20 years. So there's more stuff we don't know about concussion than there is. Um, so supposed management of concussion is uh, rest for three to seven days, excluding exercise. Slowly reintroduce work, school, and exercise. So you can't catch up in concussion when it comes to work and studies and things until your concussion is resolved. So you must um, get them to tell their teachers immediately that they've got concussion, that all assignments are postponed, all exams are postponed. They cannot push their brain. The, the more you push the brain, the worse the symptoms. Um, and once they're symptom free, you allow more. But, but exercise is probably OK. Um, so the cornerstone has always been rest until asymptomatic, but that probably excludes certain types of exercise. And it's a bit of, you know, <sighs> It's just we don't know. There is so much stuff we don't know. Um, oh, so this is the study. Association between early participation in physical activity following concussion and persistent poke concussion symptoms. So these people tend to do better, but it's, you've got you've to just follow them really well. And, and the odds are in your favour. 99% of the time, your patients are going to do wonderfully because that's what happens in concussion. And 1% of the time, you have to watch them more carefully. So it's, it's usually easy because the ones that do bad are not lost to follow up. The ones that do good are lost to follow up. Um, do, 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 that's that one again, and contacts, and et cetera. So we'll just skip through some of these ones. Um, so medical review, I, I believe, is um, as soon as they've had the injury, day three, day seven, day 21, and then you know who's having trouble. Um, if they don't come back, they're usually fine. Refer to the concussion clinic after day 10. Uh, Return to work. So it has to be tailored to their work. So you've got to take a really good social history. So what kind of work do they do? How much brain work do they have to do? How much screen work? Get them to change the settings on the screen so that there's not that much blue light. An important thing that a lot of the sports guys say that, you know, the day of the injury, no social media, no computers, no gaming. That goes straight through, you know, optic nerve into the brain, so it's very stimulating and, and very bad. Um, mm -hmm. Concussion clinics? Yes, so uh, that's the details for proactive, and of course you'll get that slide. Um, 
I, I know the other concussion clinics are good, but I just because I work with them all the time, we know each other very, very well, and that's, that's important, I feel. Um, and they'll be nationally. Ah, so this is the concussion form. So the ACC 883. This must be filled out for all patients who, who need to be seeing a concussion clinic. And there are, there are little concussion clinics and there are big concussion clinics. And everywhere near you there will be a concussion clinic. But you don't get it without this form. Um, don't manage it yourself without a concussion clinic because your resources are limited. ACC pays the clinic, not you. And so that's a very, very important point. There's some really cool things that I've only just learning about what they have the ability. So behavioural optometrists, because eye tracking is disturbed purely from a, a, a metabolic uh, structural, uh, non-structural metabolic abnormality in the brain and so they have this behavioural optometrist who retrain those eyes. They have physiotherapists whose, uh, who, whose expertise is in balance and they can retrain balance. If you do a referral to say the balance centre, that's $75 a pop. ACC, if the concussion, concussion clinic makes the referral, it's fully funded. So these things can get hugely expensive if you don't do that. And remember, they must have a diagnosis of concussion or post-concussion syndrome. Um, now, of course, um, in their extremely wonderful development, ACC have developed a new child head injury referral form. So to replace the ACC 833, we now have the ACC 7412. How many of you have actually seen one of these? So this is now the new form for, for children under the age of 15. So just familiarise yourself and have the... I'm sure ACC will be okay if you get the wrong form, but I believe it's complicated things just a little bit. Um, and as I say, they have access to um, OTPT case managers, neurologists, neuropsychologists. And the neurologist is good to back up what you've been telling your patients, really. And, uh, and so the more you see these patients, the more you learn how they're managed. And, and, uh, and the biggest lesson, and I, I know you guys already know this, but every patient teaches you something. And that's why I, I, I want to know. I have a problem and I want to know absolutely everything. And that's really hard in concussion because no one knows anything about it. So I just get every patient to teach me one small thing about what their experience is like until they're better. Um, do, do we know about that sort of stuff? Ah, okay, so management of concussive headache or post-concussion headache or persisting concussive headache. Um, in the early stages, use simple medications. Um, Panadol, ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is controversial in the first 24 to 48 hours because of the theoretical risk of bleeding, so if you don't want to give that, that's fine. Avoid opiates, full stop. Avoid sleeping tablets, full stop. Magnesium has been known um, from the International um, Headache Society as a very good anti-migraine drug. It is super duper 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 safe. It has pe pregnancy category A and it can be used intermittently or prophylactically. So um, often I will start magnesium, um, 400 milligrams a day. The most, there are a number of medicines you can use for the headache that won't go away. I don't usually start them in less than 10 days and usually on the third week. So the tricyclic antidepressants are actually the ones with the least side effects. And these doses are very low. So in actual fact, between 5 milligrams and 30 milligrams is the usual dose. If they can't sleep, amitriptyline is great for both, but it's more sedating. If they just have a headache, I usually start with nortriptyline. And I have some teenagers on 5 milligrams, and it controls that migraine-type headache. If it's more from their neck, then get a physio involved and other things. If it doesn't work, there's an escalation of different medicines, but I feel the side effects are sometimes unacceptable. But I have used Epilim in second line. I have used Gabapentin and Topamax third, time, third line, but usually after the neurologist has seen them, to be honest. Um, get yourself very familiar with amitriptyline and its side effects. Um, it's, it's pretty good, to be honest, because you remember using small doses, and you start at 10 milligrams and you increase only weekly. You continue these medications until the person is better, completely better, completely back at work, and then you discontinue slowly after one to two months. So it's a long-term medication usually for those whose headache won't get better. Melatonin is really good for sleep. Of course, it's not funded. Um, there are about three different forms. Um, know your chemist and find the cheapest one. The one I use is Worldwide Labs Slow Release 2 milligrams, and it's it's about a third of the cost of Circadian. 
So if they want to pay for circadian, that's fine, but a lot of my patients don't want to pay for that because it's not funded. It's good for sleep, and there's a lot of studies talking about melatonin and concussion, and including young kids. So there are studies that have been done in teenagers, and there's very limited side effects. Um, very rarely I will use alternative treatments like vitamin D if they've got a loss of muscle pain. Um, it seems to be quite good and so I bounced back some emails to the neurologists about why they were doing it and one of my patients. And, I, and, and so these are for people who are not getting better and they've got a lot of headaches and a lot of muscle pain and, and it's not a lot of vitamin D. You give them one tablet once a week for three weeks and then once a month after that. Um, green tea is probably the safest of the alternative things. The dose is one green tea three times a day. And don't use opiates or sleeping pills um, pretty much ever. Forget them from your plan for, for concussion. Um, medication and concussion is extremely controversial. If they're sleeping okay and they don't have headaches, there's no reason to give them medication ever. And it doesn't work for anything else. Uh, why? So why do some people get bad concussion? So these are kind of the yellow flags of concussion. And in your form that you saw earlier, they're all there. So previous concussions is the biggest risk factor. The effect is cumulative. Previous slow recovery from concussion. Genotype, which you can't test for. Um, abnormal brain chemistry. So the things that people have abnormal brain chemistry when they have ADHD, dyslexia, Erlen syndrome, which of course you all know is photochromic dyslexia, um, and anxiety and depression. So those are the comments that you always write down in your initial assessment. These people have a slower recovery from concussion. And often you'll know, having said that, a lot of my patients are completely normal and they have long concussion recovery. Um, so do we know what causes slow recussion, con concussion recovery? Absolutely not. Um, so it's always a challenge. Um, yes, predictors of post-concussion syndromes in athletes. It, it, this study showed exactly what we've said. So people with anxiety, depression, dyslexia, ADHD, um, previous concussions. Those are the big risk factors. So always pay attention to those. If someone's on their fifth concussion, then early referral. Uh, if they play contact sport, they need to seriously consider if they've got prolonged recovery, um, retirement from sport. So if someone's a really hot sports person and they're having really bad trouble, I usually refer them to a sports physician because a lot of them run concussion clinics as well. So I know Mark Fulcher from Axis Sports Medicine. He's happy seeing, by the way, anyone with concussion. So he'll, he's happy seeing an 80-year-old with concussion. He's happy seeing a child with concussion. Proactive will see children. Um, Yes, so second impact syndrome almost exclusively occurs in the young with incomplete resolution of concussion. Um, so what does incomplete resolution of concussion mean? That's a problem. Um, there's no way to reliably determine that someone has recovered from concussion. So that's why the sporting codes have the stand down period of 21 to 28 days. Guess what? Every sporting code has a different stand down period. What should you use as your default 21 days? Possibly it should be 23 to 28 days in, in youth athletes under the age of 16. Can someone who's um, had a head injury, has had concussion, and is completely better go back to sport before then? Not on my watch, so I never allow that. Someone else can let them go back to sport, but I will never, ever, ever clear anyone in less than that time because we just don't, we can't rely on these tests. They're not good enough. So you cannot say someone has recovered. It's an entirely retrospective diagnosis. Don't rely on the person. And if they had any significant symptoms in the first three days, they have concussion. You cannot remove that diagnosis. It's got to be permanently aged there. Obviously, the ambulance plays a very, very important role in, in significant head injuries and, and where you work you're always going to consider can I safely observe um, this person with significant concussion symptoms. And um, when it's busy, so I work a lot of weekends, and when it's busy I, I just don't feel that I can safely observe children, young people, older people for the amount of time if they're, if they're significantly symptomatic. And when you see them early, it's a worry. When you see them later, it's very easy, you know. Right, 
the diagnosis of concussion, you haven't breached any head injury rules, you feel like crap, that's fine. Go home and rest. But if it's within the first four hours, you, you don't know that it's just concussion. And what, what, what is just concussion? Who knows? It's very interesting. So this talks about chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is not concussion. So I am ending on this slide. I don't know a lot about this, but I do know um, that it's a progressive degenerative disease found in the brain in athletes after repetitive brain injury. It was first documented in 1920 in boxes, and it's called dementia pugilis. It results from repetitive tra brain trauma. Um, and there's built up a protein known as tau within the brain. So it becomes a structural brain injury. The changes begin months, years, or decades after brain trauma. The degenerative brain disease is associated with memory loss, confusion, impaired judgment, impaired impulse control, aggression, depression, and eventually dementia and death. So this is an extremely controversial condition and we, we really do not know enough about this. We do not know whether the athletes of today will develop this. We have no way of excluding it. So, so it's horrendously controversial and every day there's stuff in the media about concussion and so I am passionate but unfortunately I don't have all the answers. And we have all sorts of stuff that's popping up. Um, in America, they've said that no child under the age of 11 may hit her a ball. We know that uh, concussion in female football players or soccer players, for those of you who don't follow the beautiful game, um, is, is increasing exponentially, and we don't know why. Is it because of the strength of their neck muscles? Nobody really, really knows. Um, and so I want to end it about there, and I hope you've enjoyed my talk, and I hope I've answered at least one question. Uh, does anyone have any burning questions on concussion? Yes? Yes? So first question uh, about boxers is one, is boxing a sport? Um, <laughs> It's very difficult. The, the, the actual act of trying to inflict concussion upon someone is, is hugely difficult for me to deal with. Um, no, they can't go on doing this. Some of them will develop dementia. We don't know why. If they were gene tested, we might perhaps know why. So no answers there. <laughs> no. No. But neither is football. So FIFA has got no stand down period yet. And if anyone watched the World Cup, um, I was appalled by what I saw as a referee. Uh, the, only, the only power a football referee has when they see someone concussed, they cannot stop a player going, off, going back on the field. They cannot stop them returning to play. They can only say, this is not safe. We are ending the game now, believe me. And that's what I instruct the referees. Just, you give them that speech. If they don't accept that, that's the end of the game. The rules of football state that the referee is not responsible for any injury, blah, blah, blah. That is not entirely correct in this country because there's a duty of care law, which means that they're actually being negligent if they allow them to come back on. So I tell them, look, you better have a very good lawyer because even though your, your federation supports you, um, the law won't necessarily support you. Um, there should be a stand down period of 21 days for every athlete, for every sport, if they have got so called confirmed concussion. Yes? Um, some of this stuff has changed over the two years. Naps or granny naps are very, very useful for concussion people with bad symptoms, and often it's an afternoon thing. And sort of returning to school and sports sometimes, for teenagers what we like is for them to sleep in and wake up when they wake up and then do half days and third days, but everyone is so, so very different. So you have to watch them very carefully. And sometimes I've got one person who's a 17-year-old college student and they did okay and they've deteriorated, so we've just cut everything back and said we're just going to try and... Um, and, you know, I hate starting medications in teenagers, but often if they're not getting better for the headaches, we, we go really do low dose nortriptyline, and, you know, it's only a, a trickle. But it doesn't work as an antidepressant. It works in a different entity that we know f for brain chemistry, but we just don't know why. Um, but naps are often used 
and for weeks, if not months sometimes, depending, you know, the odds are in your favour, it's really hard to say. I'm supposed to finish. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy thank to talk. You. Thank you, David, for this very interesting talk. I'm sure David will still be around uh, to answer any questions. This. Uh